What is good? What is up? It's Jordan or Texans Thoughts and I'm back with another Texans film breakdown. Today, we are going to be looking at Whitney Merciless and shout outs to those who recommended him will be after the film. So Merck has long been one of the more underrated pass rushers in the NFL. However, his last season with the Texans, you know, it was a little inconsistent. He did have five sacks in his first four games, which is ridiculous. But then he only had two and a half for the rest of the season. So today, I'm going to get into what he does well for the team, and also the reasons as to why there is that drop off in pass rushing productivity. Merck is definitely someone who, he still brings value to the team through his veteran leadership and locker room presence big time. However, does that make him really worth the $54 million contract that he just signed? Let me know what you think. But if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that like button, subscribe for more content, and comment down below your thoughts on the video. Now, let's break down the film of Whitney Merciless, because the film don't lie. The first thing I want to talk about is Merck's run defense. Every defense needs a great edge setter, and Merck has prided himself on that all throughout his career. And last year, I saw he, he did especially well against tight ends, racking up tackles for losses against them. And you really just can't expect a tight end to block Merck. On this one, you can see here that... He does real good to play it aggressively. He creates the contact, driving his punch into the chest of the tight end so he's more powerful. That's how he stacks the block. Then he's able to shed it. He just pushes him out of the way. He just outmans him, gets off the block, and makes the TFL. Now, especially early on in the season, teams thought that they could get away with putting a tight end on Merck and running it in his direction, but that was just never the case. Another great example of stacking and shedding it right here, he just shoves the tight end to the side and you simply just can't put a tight end to block Merck. It's just not gonna work out for you, man. He's too technically sound in his stacking and shedding technique. He takes pride in run defense, and he's just stronger than these tight ends, so that's honestly just an automatic like tackle for loss or no gain. And here's just a couple more plays showcasing his skills in this area, and you know, obviously his pass rushing skills are the most important aspect and most valuable aspect to an edge defender. However, we can't forget about the run defense because getting these tackles for losses or no gains, that helps put the offense behind schedule, gets them into second and third and longs, and then that puts Merck, JJ, Jacob Martin, Grenard, everyone else into the position where they can pin their ears back and then get after the quarterback on third and longs. But now that we've touched on that and explained the importance of it, let's get to the pass rushing part of Merciless's game because I'm sure that's what you're most interested in. And... He's always been a technician. He's never really been a guy who's relied on his athleticism to get him sacks and get to the quarterback. He's always had a lot of pass rushing moves, and I'm going to go through his three main ones today. So this first one is a nasty instant spin move. And I say instant because a lot of the most common spin moves you'll see is a edge defender. They'll rush downfield. They'll kind of fake an outside speed rush. And then once they got the offensive tackle's hips turned, then boom, they'll spin back inside, kind of as a counter. However, Merck never does that. He actually just throws an instant spin move right off the snap. So usually he'll take two or three steps, usually just two. Like on this one here, he takes his first two steps and then he starts his spin move. And so what he does is he shoots his left hand out to kind of bait the tackle's hands and kind of push them away as well. And so you can see here how that left hand pushes away Will Richardson's left hand there. And so that stops the tackle from punching Merck and delaying this entire move. So that's part one of the spin move. Now part two is to quickly obviously make that spin, make that 360 turn, and he does that very smoothly. But now the next part is finishing the spin move. And this is the part that separates the average and the bad spin moves from the great and the elite ones. And it's all about timing your wrap around and kind of like box out almost. I don't know the exact terms for it, but you see that Merck's right hand here, he kind of wraps around Richardson's waist and tries to box him out from the play so that he can't recover and he can't push Merck out of the pocket. And Merck is able to force the fumble here, which I'm not going to like break down or anything, but obviously that was a huge part of his game. And creating turnovers is, is what made him so, so impactful at the beginning of the season. Now, another move that Merck loves is just his rip move. And he uses a couple moves to get to that move first. And I'm going to show one of those with this one. It's his club move. So he's going to read the run fake here. He's stacking the block, reads that it's a run, then boom. You see his right arm tries to club away Richardson's left arm and it doesn't work. That's not able to get him free. So he has to go to his next move and that's his rip move. And so he's going to use his inside arm, which is his left arm here, to get up underneath Richardson's arms and then rip up. And so you can see that he kind of makes like an L shape with his arm and that's and that puts the offensive tackle in a really like uncomfortable position that they're not able to hold the block and you can see how that gets him free for the hit. Now the thing about the rip move is it's pretty basic. You know, every pass rusher worth their damn has the rip move because it's the best way to kind of finish off getting to the quarterback. 
and it's all about how you set up getting to that rip move that's going to make it successful or not and so luckily murk has a couple ways to get to that so we saw the club before now this one's kind of like a stab or a chop depending on what you really call that but you can see here that he's going to shoot out his left arm and he's going to try and swat away Teron armstead's initial hands that are kind of low here and it honestly doesn't really work that well, but it does allow him to get kind of really close to Armstead and get into his chest. And as a offensive tackle, you never want to allow a pass rusher into you because that just makes your job so much harder. And it allows Whitney Merciless to use that rip move very effectively because he's get allowed to get so close. Then at this point, boom, when he's kind of turning the corner at this point, you can see that his left arm, his inside arm is hooked underneath and it gets him past Armstead for the sack. Now, the last move that he uses quite often is his long arm move. And he's using the principle here of one arm is longer than two. You know, if you want to try it out, you can reach farther in one direction with just holding out one arm than when you're trying to go with two. And so that's a very common technique that pass rushers will use because depending on the matchup that you've got, some tackles you want to get into their chest and make a quick move. Some tackles you just don't want them to ever let you punch them and you want to hold them off with your own length. And that's what Merck does here against Greg Little, the Panthers rookie left tackle. He's a second round pick and he uses that inside arm really nicely. You'll see that his left arm, boom, it goes out into his chest. The hand placement is really good because you want to get into the chest to be more powerful. And you can see that his arm is just longer than Greg Little's arms, who actually has really long arms himself. Whitney only has 34 inch arms, whereas Little has 35 inch arms. And so it may not, may not seem like a lot, but that inch is actually a very big difference. However, Wit is able to make it up because he uses one arm arm instead of two and then you can see that little's just never able to get an actual punch onto merciless to ever stop his rush so he has momentum all the way to to get to the quarterback for another forced fumble so Merck looks great right but then why did his production just fall off a cliff after those first five games well it's honestly because he started to play actual like average or even above average tackles and he just wasn't up to that raising competition level and what got him those those first five sacks was he was playing against backup or pretty bad tackles. He had two sacks against Will Richardson, and he is the Jaguars backup left tackle. You know, their starter is Cam Robinson. And later in the season, when he played against Cam Robinson, he was a lot worse. And I'll show that later. Then another sack came against Greg Little, who is, like I said, a rookie, a rookie second rounder, who is honestly not very good whatsoever. The number four was against Chargers Trent Scott, who, if you ask any Chargers fan, will tell you that he's absolute one of the worst tackles in the league. He's their version of Chris Clark. And this one here, it's just like an effort play. It's not even like anything like he's beating him. And then the last one he did have against Teron Armstead, which I can't take away from him whatsoever. Armstead's one of the best left tackles in the game. And that was a great sack. But that's one out of the five that he had. All those other ones were against awful tackles. And so that's why context needs to be taken into account when you're talking about sacks. Because actually analyzing those sacks, like, like yeah, you should be able to beat up on a below average tackle. Good job for you. But you've also got to be able to be consistent against guys of higher caliber. And Whitney was just not that whatsoever. And that's not what I want to be paying $54 million for. Only a guy who can beat up lower competition and not guys who he can win against at his own level. That's not worth it in my opinion. After those first four games, he started to play at least a little upgrade of tackles against Caleb McGarry, who was a first round pick. And he was actually pretty good for the Falcons last year. Or against Falcons left tackle Jake Matthews, who's a pretty great left tackle. He's above average for sure, and he's just able to push Merck completely out of the way. He gets hands on him so easily. Against Anthony Costanzo, a great left tackle. He's going to try and use his rip move and then spin back to the inside, but Costanzo is just really good at resetting his punch, resetting his hands, and keeping a clean pocket. So those moves that worked so well against lesser tackles just weren't working, and Merck's power wasn't really a tool either against Orlando Brown, who he's very powerful dude, he's one of the strongest right tackles, but Merck's just not able to get him to move whatsoever. And now against Cam Robinson, like I said, he tries to get into his chest and bull rush him, but that's a clean pocket for Gardner Minshew to work with. Sure, Merck blows him back maybe a yard, but he has no move to disengage and get off the block and actually make an impact on this play. And what I noticed is that when tackles were able to punch Merck first, it was basically over. On this play, Robinson does a great job to get into his chest, and Merck is pushed so far past the pocket, and he's never even able to use a pass rushing move to try and get past him. And I promise you, I'm not just cherry picking, like I have nothing against Merck. I want him to be great. He's on my team, you know, I want him to be great. I'm just telling y'all what I see and the truth on the film. And these are all one-on-one -on -one pass rush reps. It's not like he's getting doubled, but he is going up against actual starting NFL tackles. And it's not looking great. Those tackles were honestly just better than Merciless. But the other part of his game that I think hurting him is his lack of bend. And like I said before, he's never been a great athlete, but you really need bend to be able to bend to the quarterback and shorten your angle. Because you can see here how he just gets pushed out of the play way too easily. 
he's not able to actually bend. And if you look at Jacob Martin, he's a guy who shows really great bend and even JJ Watt, how they're able to flip their hips and get to the quarterback. And Merck is just not able to do that anymore. And it results in a lot of these wide kind of looping rushes that just never really even have a chance to get to the quarterback. Because obviously you want to take the shortest path possible to get to the quarterback before they get the ball out. But Merck very often takes these wide angles and that gets him in a shitty position because he just gets pushed past the pocket. And you can't make a tackle there, obviously. Look at this one where he wins to the outside nicely and he tries to get low and turn his hips but he's just not able to and it's just too wide of an angle, it takes too long to get to the quarterback and he's able to get the ball out before Witt can sniff him. And it comes back to beating their hands too because he does a decent job to beat them initially but then Luan's able to recover and push him out of this play and Merck got so close but again that bend, if he was able to bend that at a sharper angle, not allowing him to push him out of the play, that would have been perfect. This one here too where when he tries to go outside it just almost never works because he's too wide and loopy. He's never able to turn that corner. And even if you go and look back at his sacks, two of them were this exact type of wide loopy rush. And you're going to say to me, oh well it worked out here, it's just two times, you can get it more often, right? But this only happens because of the interior rush. Look at DJ Reader right here and how he bull rushes the center backwards. And that pushes Kyle Allen backwards and he runs right into Whitney Merciless. Because if that pocket doesn't get compromised, if he has a clean pocket, he's just going to stand there all day long and Witt is not going to be able to have the right angle to close in on the quarterback. He's going to get pushed past Kyle Allen here and never have the opportunity. But it's because of DJ Reader. It's because of the interior pass rush ability that opens this up for Merck. And so a lot of people say that, oh, Merck, he just needs JJ Watt to be on the field. And oh, he's going to get double less. He's going to have more one-on-ones. But I just showed you that those one-on-ones, he's still not winning them against average or above average tackles. He either needs a bad tackle or he needs interior pass rushing help. And so that's the part that, that the Texans can actually control. Generating an interior rush, whether it's Charles Omenuhu, who showed great promise from that last year, or Ross Blacklock, who has all the athletic potential in the world to become a good pass rusher eventually, we need someone to generate that pass rush from the interior and help out Merck. That's what's going to help him out more than having JJ Watt healthy. Mark my word on that. I honestly believe that's what's more impactful to him becoming a better pass rusher. You can see it on this sack here against Will Richardson as well. This time there's interior pressure from Brendan Scarlett. He pushes the quarterback out of the pocket and right into Merck who's waiting for him because he takes these wide angles that don't always work if the quarterback's allowed to just sit in the pocket. So that's why the interior pass rush is honestly the key to the Texans defense being, being much improved. It's going to help Merck, it's going to help everyone on the edge, and interior pressure is a lot harder for a quarterback to escape. So I'm really hoping one of those young guys can step up and help Merck and JJ in that sense. Alright, that'll do it for my Whitney Merciless film breakdown, and thank you to those who recommended this video. So shout out HTAT, Phone, Elwin, Alonzo Rico, Manel Ponte, and Gabriel Porter. I appreciate y'all and love interacting with you in the comments. Your feedback and support really does mean a lot to me. And I apologize if I mispronounced any of your names or missed your comment about Merck. But talking about the video, you know, I'm never looking to hate on a player, so I hope it didn't come off that way. But I'm also never going to sugarcoat my opinions. I'm going to bring y'all what I see in the film, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All of it. So do I think Merck should have been given a $54 million deal? No. Hell no. I don't think he can produce at the level that warrants that type of money against top competition without serious, serious help around him. But from some of the stories I've heard about what he does for the young guys and in the locker room, he's the best veteran leader on that team, and that definitely has its values. He should be a great mentor to guys like Jacob Martin and Jonathan Grenard, molding them into the future outside linebackers for the Houston Texans. And even though Merck may not be in his prime anymore, there's still ways to maximize his talents, surrounding him with an interior pass rush that can help him finish off sacks at a better rate, and make his job easier. So if you enjoyed the video, please do hit that like button, subscribe for more content, and comment down below your thoughts on the video. If you're still listening, you're a real one. I appreciate you. And the question of the day is, do you think Anthony Weaver will be able to get more production out of Merck? Let me know. Also, I'm a part of Texans Unfiltered. I write articles about Texans film breakdowns on our awesome website. We also got a weekly podcast on all your typical platforms. So if you're itching for more Texans content, we got you. The links will be in the description. All right, this was Jordan or Texans Thoughts. Hope you enjoyed and come back for more. Videos every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Take care, everyone. And remember, the film, don't lie.